We call it boilerplate. It means it can't be defeated. And we can get in hard copy about this uh, chain of command? Hard copy? What do, you, what do you mean you need a hard copy? Uh, as in, um, you Who saw... runs what government agency? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're the president of your country, pre-simulation denture. He's a, sim, he's a puppet. All presidents worldwide are puppets. The postmaster general is who runs your government. Who's on your money? Your president or your postmaster, Queen Elizabeth? Well, where did you get this from? That's the same in all countries worldwide. And where I'm a postmaster through studying how to be a postmaster. I have my sea, sea pass, my sea treaty, my drogue law, my, my port authority, my judgeship, my kingship. I was elected king of Hawaii when the 52 families of the Hawaiian kingdom voted to uh, elect me their king because I was the, I only did work in syntax, mathematics, and nobody can argue that three plus three equals six, even though they fight amongst themselves on subject matter. They couldn't argue about math. So I wrote the apology bill for Bill Clinton and he had to, it was upheld at the World Court at The Hague. Bill Clinton had to apologize for the, to the Hawaiian people for stealing the Hawaiian Islands. And they elected me King of Hawaii, at which then I wrote the Constitution of Hawaii. I established the Constitution of New Zealand, Australia, and the United Nations. I then wrote the, uh, the Charter Trust for the Kapuna Council, so that they had a legitimate Council trust and constitution to operate government, got your license plates for the cars, driver's licenses for their driving, and public safety is the number one jurisdiction over all countries and all things. If you maintain the rules and regulations of public safety, that you can read, write, have knowledge of how to operate the machinery of an automobile, you have, you understand about uh, not transporting chemicals or things that are deadly to other human beings, that you maintain good hygiene so that you don't get yourself sick and transport diseases, and you maintain a high standard of public safety, you will then be respected to be an independent people. Now the Hawaiian people were never conquered by the United States government. And uh, I'll do a little timeline here and show you how World War II started. Are these public safety rules, where do, can we download them? Public safety? That's just your research. This comes where? from 74,000 hours of study. Where can we get a copy of that? In my books. Okay, thank you. My books go through all these different programs. Now, the reason I bring up this thing in Hawaii, because Hawaii un unlocked the secrets of both New Zealand and Australia. You guys are cousins. The, the Maori people, the Origini people, by the way, it isn't Aborigine, AB means no Origini. And Maori is an M O U, it's M O, I mean, M O O, M A. Uh, yeah, M A U R I is the correct spelling, not O. There's no O in it. Um, what I'll do is I'll put up the timeline of how this all took place and unlock the secret of who was in charge. And this just came about on January 6th of, of 2009 that we were able to break this code as a result of a little tiny newspaper article that we found in the archives at the Iolani Palace by accident. Now, we went down to the Iolani Palace and we wanted to know what happened in 1873. We wanted to look at a flag. And we, they, the librarian says, well, we don't have any flags I mean, we don't have any newspaper articles from 1869 to 1875. And I'm going, well, that's impossible. You guys had treaties out here every couple of weeks because Hawaii was the hub of the Pacific. We said, nope, that six year block has been removed. So we went, as you said, there's a card catalog, as big as that wall over there. So we started looking and we found one card that said, 1873 and it had a number on it. I said, what's this number mean? He says, what's well, microfish number? So we went and got the microfish film. And on this here, in 1873, they ran a newspaper, was about 11 inches wide and about 17 inches long. Now at the top had a flag, but it was the wrong flag of Hawaii. It had eight stripes instead of seven. And Hightower was the one that found that. 
But in the bottom of the, of the newspaper was the obituaries with four Masonic symbols, the all-seeing eye and the triangle. Now what they did here is there was two for the Eastern stars in Portuguese and French and two for the English and German Masons to all come to, to the lodge number one across the street from the Elani Palace. Now that lodge number one afterwards in 1893 became the, the first post office in Hawaii and a year later became the Supreme Court of Hawaii, same building. So this was Masonic. So we took the date, and this was, the date was January, wrong color, they brought green, I can't win today. <laughs> January 11th was the name, it was the date of the newspaper, and it said they were ordering all people, all Masons to come to Lodge Number 1 on January uh, 14th. Now it takes three days for the boats to go all the way out to the outer island, 220 miles, and three days to bring all the Masons back to Lodge Number 1. So you had six days to here, and you get the 17th. And the 17th, January 17th, uh, 1873, was the fulcrum of events to take place. Now, when all the Masons met at the lodge, they met on the 14th, and they cut a secret treaty with the post office to take over the Hawaiian Islands after all Hawaiians were declared dead 20 years later. It's called the Death Moratorium. Now, the Death Moratorium was established in 1849 by King Kamehameha III and said that if you are off the land or dead for 20 years, the land is free for settlement. So then we went back before that in October 22nd, 1872 was the first paper money issued in Hawaii. That meant that the post office through Bern, Switzerland got the King Kamehameha the V to file bankruptcy, ship the gold out and bring paper money in. And that's when the paper money started in Hawaii. Exactly 45 days later, under Maritime Law of Trust, which was December 7th, King Kamehameha V dies. Yeah, dies, right. 45 days from the time he files bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trust expired. So now he is the last reigning monarch in Hawaii, and he dies, putting 1.8 million acres of land up for grabs according to this treaty. That was better known as the Bishop's Trust for those of you who know about it. Now this number, December 7th, is real keen. Now if you take 45 days from that, you get the 14th plus three-day grace period, better known as the Lemon Law. You have the same thing in this country, a three-day grace period when you sign a contract. So you got December 17th now, 45 days plus a three-day grace period of 1873, add the 20-year moratorium, you get 1893, and when did they, the United States government, or United States Postal Service controls all military vessels in the United States and Japan. This is a real keen thing here. 1893, you get the, you get the uh, 17th day of January, 1893, and that's when they, the United States government comes in with the warship and orders King Ilani, uh, Queen Iolani to stand down. Now, through a little research, because I'm a 92nd degree Mason, Queen Iolani is a Eastern star. Because she's an Eastern star, she takes her orders from the Postmaster General of Hawaii, who was the Chief Master Mason. He takes his orders from the Admiralty warship that pulled into port on the 14th of January, 1893, under the three-day law, ordering him to take over the palace. And Queen Iolani, on the 17th of January, goes ahead and surrenders Hawaii to the, to the Masons, which are controlling the post office. And the post office, through the military, 
now takes over and declares the Hawaiian Islands to be a territory of, of the United States. Because there was no shots fired, the treaty that they wrote was written in adverb verb, which means it didn't say anything. They have no contract. The Admiralty has no contract to invade the island. But because no one can read and write at this point in history, everybody goes along with it. And because the Masons are controlling the post office, the post office is telling the, the uh, a senior postmaster is telling a Eastern Star post uh, queen to stand down. In order to become a Mason, you must surrender your kingship, queenship, or political title. If you're president, you have to surrender it to the Masons and take your orders from the post office. Same thing here in Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, the United States. The United States President Obama is the puppet. Potter is our Postmaster General. He's the one that pulls the strings and controls all branches of government. You have the same thing here, and that's why Queen Elizabeth's on your money. So it's a post office giving you orders, not the England. Now, if you subtract, if you bring this thing forward to October 22nd, 1872, plus 70 years, it comes out plus 45 days in the three-day trusts. It's December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor gets bombed by the Japanese. The bankruptcy of, Japan, of Hawaii ends. 70 years, 45 days of trust in three-day grace period, except the Japanese Navy jumps the gun by one hour. And they bomb all the postal vessels of the United States Post Office which are all the military warships and military warplanes, but they didn't bomb any civilian targets. But because they, uh, Hawaii was not out of bankruptcy because of the one hour time difference, they violated the international laws of bankruptcy, which then gave Roosevelt permission to declare war against Japan. And we had to go to Tokyo to get the rest of the story on the post office. So it was the postal post office of Japan, which controls the military, bombing the post office of Pearl Harbor, which was the United States post office, because of trade imbalances. That's what started the war between Japan and the United States. And I have two videos where Fat Boy and Little Boy, better known as the atomic bombs, where the postmaster general of Hawaii is slapping a $1 airmail stamp on the bombs, signing his name across to his postmaster, canceling the stamp, and saying, just to make it legal, we are sending the air freight back to Japan. And that was the post office going to war against the post office. Same thing took place between uh, Poland, coming out of bankruptcy at the stroke of midnight, 1939, and Germany invading Poland because they were no longer bankruptcy protection. That's how that all happens. Same thing takes place down here. Your post office runs everything. And because the post office controls all the vessels in dry dock, which are you, the people, you're required, you, know, you, you carry money in your pocket, and the money you carry in your pocket makes you postal employees of the post office. Therefore, you are vessels in dry dock, and you have to be licensed to go between point A and point B, your corporate employees. Now, another question came up on birth certificates. What is your birth certificate? Your birth certificate is a document that allows the government, 45 days after you're born, you're a live individual under maritime law of trust because you are an issue of state, better known as a, um, let's see, you are a child, C-H-I-L-D. Child means issue of woman. At the end of 45 days, you are a child issue of state and your birth certificate expires and now you become, your, you get your social security number, $1 million. Back when I was there, it was only 600,000. Today it's a million based on inflation. Has to be placed into the system and a bond is issued. And they sell these bonds on the New York Stock Exchange. 
The Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Australia is listed on the Securities and Exchange Commission. You guys are, are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, the country of Australia. You're a corporate entity. Okay, now, every person is born, you have to put this million dollars into the hopper so there's money there accumulating interest at 6% a year to offset inflation to then supply the money necessary for you to be paid for your food, clothing, housing, transportation, all your toys you're going to buy throughout life, your gambling, those that are better have more, those that are sloppy have less. And that's where that, that's where that how do you get the money into the system. And it's a chain reaction that has to keep on going on and on and on, and that's the only way that commerce moves so that you have some way to balance who has value? Because every, nobody wants to go out there and work for nothing. Question? Who puts this money into the... the post menu? office does. Because you're a vessel and a postal employee under the post office, and they're responsible for your care. That's why you have social security and social medicine. In the event any one of you uh, that have a driver's license or social security card were to become injured. Let's say you got in a car accident and become a paraplegic. The state will come in, give you medical, food, clothing, shelter. You have a handicap sticker and you'll get that for the rest of your life. How does the post office take um, control of the human as opposed to the um, original um, Voluntary diversity? compliance. <laughs> what is the, at which point, what is the voluntary compliance? Well, when you turned 18 years old, you had one thing on your mind, girls, cars, and money. And the girls had one thing on their mind, boys, cars, and money. And it's sex. And sex is the number one motivator. You didn't care about politics. How many kids we got in here today? How many people under the age of 40 are in here? Oh, just five. Okay, five out of 60 ain't bad. <laughs> I thought you said it happens 45 days after. But right, 45 days after you become a child, issue a state. If your mother and father neglect you, the state will come in, take you, put you in an orphanage, make sure you have food and clothing and shelter until you're 18 years old. They will educate you, send you to school, and on your 18th birthday, you have the choice to leave the orphanage and go out in the world, but the, every place you go, they're gonna say, you want a license for driving? You want a license for work? You want money uh, so that you can propagate the species and go out and meet girls and, and play. You didn't care about the post office when you were 18 years old. You weren't even a bit curious. And so when you're 40 years old and you wake up, you, you roll over and say, hey, we're not, not, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So 45 days from birth, not from 18 years old. Right. They well, no, that's, that's another thing. When you turn 18 years old, you've got 45 days to make a choice. And even when you, turn, when you turn 18 years old, you also have to register for the draft at the post office because the post office has a ball on top of the flagpole because that is advertising, the, that's advertising for re, uh, recruiting for the military. Don't believe me, go down to your post office, look at your flag outside, they've got a ball on top. If they have a spear on top of the flagpole, that's for military court marshals. That's for inside your courthouses. Now, you guys don't have flags in your courthouses down here. You've got, you've got seals, but the seals are changing. Every time you modify the condition of the seal, you're in a different courtroom. So don't be gullible enough to think that the jurisdiction is really unique, because it's not. And they change jurisdictions every time you go into that court. If you don't know what's going on, they won't change it. But if you have knowledge, if they know you have syntax, if you're doing my paperwork, every time you walk through that door, they're gonna change the rules on you. What is the purpose of changing the jurisdiction? Because under 45 days laws of trust, your old trust expires. The old cause of action expires. They'll even change judges on you every 45 days. So there's no continuance of evidence between one violation and another violation. And for you to go out and sort out where the violations took place, 99.99% of people don't have a clue that they're being harvested. Who stands at the bottom of Lady Justice here in Australia? Ever see a statue? Got a sword in one hand for enforcement, a scale in the other hand for balancing the good and the evil, 
And what lays at the feet of Lady Justice? Sheep. We fleece the sheep. We don't kill them. Does that mean that if you go into a court that has changed jurisdiction, you can walk out? No, that means if you walked in there, you acknowledge the fact that they had jurisdiction. It's called voluntary compliance. But if you've only just become aware, let's say you walk into a court and you re realize that they've changed the seal in the court and they've changed the judge, does it not give you the opportunity to uh, walk out? Uh, well, let's see. If you walk into the courtroom, you don't have paperwork, you're going to be guilty of a Title 46, Chapter 781, a derelict vessel of trans trans um, trespassing on a foreign vessel in dry dock without a passport or your papers. Now you're an illegal vessel that's just docked yourself on somebody else's vessel. Just like if you go out here to the harbor and try and get on a Japanese or Chinese ship out here without any ship's papers or permission to go up there, you will be arrested and put in a brig for trespassing. Are they not under some sort of uh, rule that if they change jurisdiction that they have to notify you? You're supposed to know. Knowledge, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You have to know what all the jurisdictions are, all the seals are, all the placements. If you want to go and play in their, in their sandbox, you've got to know what the rules are. And what are the rules? It's called law of the flag advertises the contract. But they don't use flags, they use seals. But the contract means both parties, my understanding of a contract is where uh, two or more parties are aware of all the conditions of the contract. And should one party change the, any of the conditions in the contract without the knowledge of the other party, it makes the contract null and void. That's correct. Therefore, they have a duty of care to inform the other party that they've changed in jurisdiction. You never had any rules and regulations. Has anyone in this room ever filed a quantum lawsuit in court? No. You only had adverb, verb, rules, regulations, codes, lawsuits. You didn't put stamps or flags on your paperwork. Everything you've done in this country since 1800, since the English showed up here, has been a violation of syntax. And, it, and that lie is not just now, it isn't just here, it's 8,500 years running in 5,000 languages. So what you're saying, since the original contract was based on no rules. No rules still apply. Therefore, they can anyone, any party can change the rules at any time without due notice. Except for one little detail. They got guns and clubs, and they're standing here with guns and clubs on both sides of you, and you're totally intimidated because you don't know where you are. You don't know what you're doing. You've wandered into some place you shouldn't be or you were doing something out in the real world you shouldn't have been doing, that's why you're in there in the first place. And so you didn't do your homework. You don't have a six-year college degree in, in, uh, to know what a barrister knows, but a barrister only knows how to read and write an adverb verb. And he's restricted to do that because they have a code. No law or fact shall be tried in court. That is their law. That is their oath. Every judge, barrister, lawyer, attorney, worldwide, all countries, all languages swear to this. Because for 8,500 years, language has been bastardized. It is adverb, verb, illusion. So you've got an adverb that's a negative adverb modifies the verb or is a conjunction, back becomes a, a verb, shall is a pronoun, be is an adverb, making try to be a past time uh, adverb, I mean past time verb, in is an adverb, modifies the verb court, it's a dangling participle. You've got a verb law, a verb fact, and a verb court. You can only have one jurisdiction in court, it's called a least common denominator. In a math problem, you must always acquire the least common denominator in order to solve the problem. Your least common denominator is one. You got one jurisdiction under maritime law, one jurisdiction under maritime facts, and one jurisdiction under maritime court called verb, which is an illusion. In an illusion, three plus three equals all numbers in the universe except six. You can't try three plus three equals six. 
You know how this started? 1980, they took away my children. I went to trial 65 times, and on the 65th trial, the judge says, you can have your kids. I am convinced that you are a good father and that you really want your kids. I'm going, I'm going to sue you for apartheid. He says, I just gave you your kids. I said, every time I say yes, you said no. Every time I said no, you said yes. What's different today? And he says, because, he says, I have the power. I will say no every time you say yes and say yes every time you say no. I says, oh, I can't win. Is that right? He says, not a chance in hell unless I want to give it to you. I says, I says so you're telling me you're never going to agree with me. He goes, that's, that's right. He says, I'm never going to agree with you. He says, it's my privilege to give you your kids. I says, it's three plus three equals six. He goes, yeah. I says, you just agreed with me. He says, well, that's a math problem. No one ever went to war over a math problem. He says, oh, what you're saying to me then is, if I can discover the mathematical interface of all 5,000 languages, that you will give me my kids because I will bring a lawsuit to this court that has the accuracy of a math problem. He says, yeah, I'll do that. So I walked out of that courtroom. I says, all right. He says, you're a smart guy. The judge gets off the bench. He's out the door. I'm still in the courtroom picking up my papers. And he sticks his head back and he says, you're a smart guy, Dave. You'll figure it out. Well, on April 6, 1988, I broke the code and figured it out. You know what the first thing I did was? Went back and sued Judge Wazalewski for apartheid and genocide against humanity. I had 400 state judges and 38 federal judges that recused themselves in that lawsuit. And 14 judges, including Judge Statmiller, who was our chief judge, after he got locked out of 47 courtrooms that day, we ran around all day long. They were slamming the doors. He's pounding on the doors. Let me in. He's no, you can bring in that, that trash in here. All the judges knew about syntax by then. And they wouldn't. So Statmiller says, I'm chief judge. Nobody can overrule me. I'll take the case. It took him 20 minutes to recuse himself. And 400 other judges recused themselves, including the 38 federal judges. Then they brought Judge Moser in, 97 years old, off the bench, 28 years, retired. Sharp as a pin at 97 years old. I beat him twice, including defeated him from awarding three attorneys $54,000 in fees. He says, I don't know who you are, he says, but your statute of limitations is running out. Because I wouldn't give my name. Wouldn't get, make contract with them. And I was right the whole time. And I won that case hands down. I've never paid an attorney in 30 years. Um, somebody's asked me to ask this question. Is what, um, what is the second degree Mason? What is what? What is the second degree Mason? 90 oh, 90 second? I, OK, it holds the, math, it holds the math interface in all 5,000 of the languages. When I travel around, I have master masons, 33, 34 degree masons, and they want to know what the Mason, Masonic codes are. And I, I own one of five copies of Stanley Hawes' The Secret of All Ages. It's a big book. It's 15 inches wide, two feet tall, and two inches thick. Big book. Big book, 1,000 pages in it. The ones you can buy on the internet only have f about half that information. But then I went ahead and I syntaxed it. One third of all the words are missing from that book, so it's even bigger than that. The, the things that I do when I read information. Uh, last night I pulled up the flag of Australia, the 1853 flag of the Origini people. And I syntaxed it. The Queen Elizabeth said that there were, is no flag that cannot be seen and we will not acknowledge the people because they don't exist. And then signed it Elizabeth. Really? Which means she says there are no people, there are no rules, there are no regulations, there are no codes, there is not a flag. If you people want to believe in your illusion, I'll just uh, italicize my name as Elizabeth, which means it's not on the paper. And it's called an act. ACT, all words that start with a vowel, 